COVID-19 is affecting 213 countries and territories around the world, sending billions of people into lockdown as health services struggle to cope. More than 29 million have or have had the virus and close to a million people have died. However, Pakistan have had a steep drop in infections. Dr. Faisal Sultan is Prime Minister Imran Khan's special assistant on national health services, regulations and coordination. Faisal, thank you very much for joining us. Pakistan has recorded a steep drop in infections since its peak, surprising many commentators. Could you bring us up to date on the change in Pakistan's infection rates and deaths in recent months? Yes, um, I think uh, we've had a um, steady decline uh, since the middle of June. There were uh, a number of different projections, both within the country as well as outside, uh, and all the projected numbers from um, either data science uh, calculations or epidemiologic calculations um, seem to suggest uh, that the epidemic, uh, the numbers were going to be much worse than they actually turned out to be. So uh, the, the, the what's there, meaning you know, we do know that uh, death numbers, the new cases per day, uh, the percentage positivity, uh, the occupancy of the health system, all of these uh, parameters have actually come down steadily and consistent with each other. All the numbers have been uh, have, have had uh, internal consonants with each other. Now, the question of why is, is a much harder one uh, because uh, we do have uh, countries with similar uh, social economic situations, and yet uh, they are different. We have uh, India uh, at the present time, uh, the numbers are uh, still high, and, and, and many cities are struggling with the, with the virus. So, um, what is it that uh, made a difference? To be perfectly honest, um, there are two parts to this. Um, you know, we can divide this into uh, our programmatic interventions. Uh, and of course, the second part would be the biology of the disease, which really encompasses uh, the host, uh, the pathogen, which is the virus, the environment, and of course, uh, the, the social structure of the, of the society. Uh, but let's talk about the first part, which is the interventions. I think one of the most important interventions um, that in, in we were able to do in Pakistan was to uh, sit under one roof uh, in one room uh, and coordinate um, and collate all the data coming through uh, from every single lab, from every major hospital, uh, then to evaluate, analyze, critically look at this data, and to devise uh, strategies for intervention. And then to reach out to all the uh, provincial decision makers, uh, with their health ministers, with their senior bureaucracy, as well as the chief ministers. And so this coherence, coordination, and a unified response is, I think, uh, the single most factor that helped us uh, in, in synthesizing, putting together this response. Uh, this has included a lot of different inputs, uh, and you know, one can barely go into details of any one of those. But the, 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 the fundamental issue has been ensuring that the data that is coming in is right, is accurate, is timely. Um, the analysis of it uh, is done in a nuanced way and with full you know, critique and, and dissection from all sides. And then once the actions are decided, uh, they are communicated to those that are going to implement them, uh, down to the smallest administrative units. Uh, as well as hearing back from them as to what was feasible, what was difficult, where the issues were, and then to go back and try to fix those as well. So I think, you know, if I were to narrow this down, the, our actions um, were data-driven, and I think they had consequences. Uh, every action in an epidemic uh, is, may not be perfect. You may say, well, wear masks, and you know, only a certain percentage of people are wearing masks. And you may lock down uh, a certain area, but the Restrictions may not be perfect and may not be perfectly enforceable. Yet, uh, because an epidemic depends on the number of interactions between, between, between infected and uninfected individuals, each time you reduce the statistical odds of the interaction, um, the epidemic slows down by that very much. And then they all What's the situation in terms of testing? Has testing increased or stayed the same? So we've uh, 
when we started out, what was the testing story, which I think began at the right at the outset. So we started out with one or four labs in the country, and then uh, we gradually built up our capacity. So that was the first challenge, was to be able to have um, labs that were able to do the PCR for coronavirus uh, across many different domains and areas um, in, across the entire geography of Pakistan. Um, and that was built up gradually and organically, but in a pretty fast pace, I would say. Um, so we were able to reach um, uh, uh, a full capacity of uh, testing between 50 and 70,000 tests every day. Uh, at no point did we utilize all of this capacity. Our, um, at the peak, we were doing about uh, 30,000 tests, and as the disease abated, the number of daily tests have come down uh, to about between 20 and 25,000. I would say you know, the average on a given day in the last few weeks has been about 20,000 tests a day. Um, so while they are not uh, a huge number of tests, but they are enough uh, that provide us with some semblance of what's going on. And we've not just looked at the absolute positives out of the test, but trends. And what were the statistical likelihood of a test being positive on a given day? And so, as time has gone on, we have come down from, um, you know, so the twenties, so the thirty-two, thirty-three percent uh, positivity uh, in June, down to below two percent for the last uh, week or two. So, that's been a, 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 a very important parameter to look at, especially when you are not doing. Uh, tests uh, that are, um, you know, that cover the entire population or any, anywhere near that. So I think we've, we've utilized and deployed our tests, uh, you know, very strategically and to make sure uh, that the resource that we have brings us the most information, uh, both for clinical care as well as for uh, strategic decision. I see that the military have also been used to help support the effort. So they were very important partners in this whole effort. So the National Coronavirus uh, Operations Command Center uh, was chaired by our uh, Minister for Planning, Mr. Asad um, uh, And so on one side, we had uh, the professional inputs, the Ministry of Health, data scientists, people myself, like myself, uh, who at that point were in their role as infectious diseases physician, um, you know, other people who were related to the response and decision-making ministers from a wide range of ministries from who to interior um, and, and so on. So th there was this professional and administrative group on one side. Uh, our military component uh, was a made up of people who helped us with the logistics, uh, with coordination, uh, and a lot of follow-up, uh, and a lot of back-end support. So for example, um, once we uh, put together our uh, contact tracing, for example, or the lab testing facility, or the lab testing connectivity. So a lot of follow-up and ensuring that any loose ends were tied up, uh, that we were able to um, uh, resolve difficulties out in the field, uh, that was really um, very nicely done and very, uh, in a very synchronized and harmonized fashion uh, by the military. So I think everybody played to their strengths. Um, the, the leadership on one hand, starting with the Prime Minister, um, the professional side on their end, and of course the administrative and logistic and coordination side, um, primarily by the Does Pakistan have a large contact tracing system compared to other countries? So countries that have had stable and well-developed public health systems obviously had, um, you know, contact tracing systems in place. Uh, compared to them, uh, I would say that our contact tracing system uh, probably bore a ratio of anywhere from you know, 1 to 8, 1 to 10 of the number of people that many of these countries had available, trained and deployed. Um, we had to really ramp up this capacity and learn this and teach this and train this as we uh, went along. Uh, but I think very interestingly and because of all the help from all quarters, uh, this contact tracing capability within the provinces, down to the districts and towns, really uh, improved tremendously. So at the present time, for example, um, we are contact tracing about 15 people who are having index patients in the province. So uh, it's not a bad number to be in at this time. And it really has helped 
in, in a number of different ways. First of all, the obvious effect in contract based you educate, you train, you restrict their movement, you talk to them, and obviously you can't, you know, post uh, a policeman outside uh, every house. Uh, so much of it is about education, about reinforcement, and uh, I think the ripple effect from that also goes out. The neighborhood realizes what's going on, and so people cooperate and uh, come together as a community. I think it has the, the, the educational and uh, communication value of contact tracing is sometimes underestimated. I think that's also been leveraged in our case. So I think we started out in a you know in a somewhat weaker position, but we're much stronger, much better, and we hope to be able to sustain and build this uh, further. One other thing I'd like to point out is that uh, uh, strengthening of a contract tracing and uh, public health response capability really helps uh, in a number of other diseases. Tuberculosis. Uh, we are one of the countries that has high incidence of tuberculosis, and we lose people to TB every year. So I think um, you know, improved contact tracing will help tremendously uh, for other diseases. So it's, this has been a success that we, we, we started out uh, on a week every year. Many countries have imposed lockdowns on business and in Australia, for example, closing internal borders. Now this causes serious economic hardship. One of our states, Victoria, has even imposed a night curfew. Now, apparently, there exist no medical reasons for such harsh measures. Can you make a comment on these measures imposed across the board? So lockdowns also generated a fair bit of uh, anxiety, controversy, debate, um, and a fair bit of polar debate, polarized debate, I would say. So when we started out um, back in uh, March, the first restrictions that were put in were mid-March for education institutions. I think strategically, scientifically, that was probably the most important step. Uh, somewhere around the 23rd, 24th of March, um, what ended up happening is that um, a number of provinces at provincial leadership um, uh, looked at uh, the data coming in from at that point in on in Europe, and of course, uh, initially from China, and um, the, the almost extrapolated idea of, of a broad lockdown um, uh, gained a lot of uh, traction. Now, the, the problem with, of course, a broad lockdown is that while um, if you could do it perfectly or near perfectly and for a sustained period and everybody did it all at once, um, it has uh, the chance of uh, slowing or stopping the epidemic. But in the connected world we live in, um, it, it became fairly clear that uh, a sustained, general, broad uh, lockdown was just not possible. So uh, after the initial uh, period of restrictions or lockdown, um, what we started to do was to evaluate how to come out of uh, this whole process. You know, locking it down in many ways is probably easier, but to unlock and to gradually Descend down from that position is, is, is a much harder thing. So, in that situation, we looked at what the risks were. We tried to evaluate the risks of opening each industrial sector, each business sector, each work activity. Um, and so, very slowly and gradually, over a period of many months, uh, we, have, uh, we are at the present situation where we are about to open up the most significant of our um, sectors, which is education. So starting the 15th of September, um, we are opening education institutions in a graduated way. So th this whole business of lockdowns and restrictions uh, was, was tough. Uh, there was a great political divide as, as well because uh, a lot of people, uh, the more urban, educated, uh, people connected uh, well to the rest of the world, saw the uh, really terrible numbers coming out from other countries and uh, felt that the only way around was on the other hand, um, uh, the larger rural, semi-urban populations who did not have any experiential, um, you know, uh, any experience of, of the virus themselves, and were perhaps less, less aware of the rest of the world, uh, were more focused on uh, the fact that they had not seen anything, and that many people felt that this was just all overblown. So to keep balance between these two uh, almost opposing narratives was was tough. Uh, and so therefore, at each time, the political leadership, the government, the governments of the provinces 
have to constantly talk, reach out, explain, uh, and, and bring, as I said, a coherent, more unified response and a point of view of what this was all about. Um, at the present time, we have uh, evolved into the smarter, more targeted, smaller lockdowns. So as the numbers have come down and as we have better um, understanding of the data, we are able to restrict our lockdowns to very really small units uh, to allow businesses and work to continue and yet to try to uh, remotize the disease where it was um, in the How do you see the virus changing Pakistan in the long term? It's changed us already, I think. Uh, how much of these changes, how many of these changes sustain over time obviously depends on how quickly the virus fades away. Uh, but it has changes. Uh, I think um, you know some changes have been for the good in the sense that we've tried to strengthen our healthcare system. Uh, and there's been much greater focus and understanding of the importance of investing in healthcare, particularly uh, the public health system. Uh, the society at large, I think, uh, also has um, changed, like the rest of the world. Um, you know, um, what would used to be a fairly common and, and routine occurrence that you never thought about it, walking into a restaurant, taking a, getting seated at a table and eating, uh, is, is something that a lot of us just haven't done in, in, in months and months. Uh, travel. Um, then how we conduct, um, uh, of course, our routine businesses, like, as I said, schooling, education, uh, and how we adjust to modify ourselves around it. So I think that, um, and it, I'm sure it has created anxieties and pressures and uh, you know, uh, issues uh, relating to stress as well. Uh, but I think generally uh, the world spoke well with it, but um, uh, it depends a lot on how this epidemic slows down and, and you know, phase out of the system and if ever uh, there are any resurgence and etc. that will also become how it affects our future behavior and for how long do these changed behaviors uh, remain in the system. Dr. Faisal Sultan, thank you very much. Thank you.